Like I just ordered from this um this guy who I've known my whole life. Started his own little mask business. It's now been over a month since I placed that order. And I'm like Where's my shirt? And it yeah. wasn't that expensive, but at the same time it's like it's really rude, you know? Like I supported you and you can't even tell me when I'm going to get the product that I just spent my hard-earned money on. It's on the person that's manufacturing the design of my product. Yeah. So if there's some type of disconnect there, you have to plug that hole. Because if you're getting a lot of emails where it's like, where is my order? When is it coming? Then you know that you're not setting the, the accurate expectations about that order. Hey guys, when it comes to buying stuff on the internet, I feel like most people think of Amazon these days, but there's literally tens of thousands of other websites that you can buy stuff, whether it's people selling stuff through their Shopify stores or selling stuff on like eBay, for example. There's so many other ways to buy goods on the internet. And when we talk about these sort of sites, I think we talk so much about marketing and selling and driving conversions and traffic, but people don't really talk much about what happens after you sell something. Getting the stuff to the customer is, it seems simple, but it's not. And the more you sell, the more complex it gets. It's a serious pain point for a lot of companies, whether you're a mom and pop shop or uh, selling out of your sort of garage or basement, making a few thousand bucks a month, all the way up to companies like Dollar Shave Club and Kylie Cosmetics. All these e-commerce sites have to manage their logistics. After they sell the product, what does the experience look like for that customer? How soon do they get it? And how do you physically move the right product, the right order to the end consumer in a time frame that makes sense and a cost that makes sense to you. Today, I actually have an amazing interview guest. So I brought in Sora Johnston. We're friends and we've actually done another video on this channel before. Sora, in her day job, she works with these e-commerce companies every day. She's an expert on logistics. And I brought her in to talk about some of the pain points that her customers have when it comes to shipping logistics, the things that they normally fall short on, how they figure out what shipping service to use, what's gonna be the cheapest, most cost effective within the time frame that they need to ship, and what tools they use to improve this process, whether it be uh, using the right envelopes, packaging and labels, or buying some sort of software that helps them manage their orders. Before we get into that conversation, subscribe to this channel if you think this is an interesting video and hit the like button that tells me that you want more of this sort of stuff. And if you really want to support the channel, there are some uh, Amazon affiliate links in the description. If you click on one of those and you purchase something on Amazon in the next 30 days, anything on Amazon, I will get a referral kickback. So that's another way that you can support the channel. And with that, check out this interview with Sora Johnston. Well, thank you for coming back for video number two. If you haven't seen the first video, we talk about how to get jobs and it's a great video. Also popped off online. So yeah, this video is a new one. We're talking about how to start e-commerce companies. Take it away. Yeah, <laughs> that's, not, that's not a question, but <laughs> <laughs> go, ahead, go ahead and introduce yourself and let me know um, sort of where you stand in terms of getting started with e-commerce companies. Yeah, I'm Sora and I work at a API company that helps companies to essentially build out the process that they use to get a package from their warehouse to the customer's door. Yep. And the beauty of the work that I've had is that I've worked with a lot of small businesses along with a lot of large companies that are in like high growth mode. Mm -hmm. and, and the high growth is really happening not only in the US, but in Europe, you know, in Asia and a lot of different parts of the world. So I have the kind of bird's eye view into how companies are thinking about this process, no matter like the impact of regulation or what kind of industry they're in or, you know, whether or not they're growing or retracting. Like I'm working with a lot of companies that are in a lot of different stages is what I'm saying. And so the fun of my job right now is that basically Everyone wants to know how they can sell more stuff. 
and not everyone knows what they can do in order to achieve that. And so what I want to do is just basically talk about what I've seen as far as like what's working right now and like what's not going to work mm-hmm. from that trial and error that companies are doing and see if I can help just like the average everyday person to build an e-commerce business during the quarantine or during like COVID. So this is everything from sort of like your mom and pop e-commerce company to, to larger scale companies that are trying to like optimize conversions. Exactly. And a, a lot of those companies, no matter the size or where they're located geographically are making some of the same mistakes yeah. when it comes to logistics. And so I think the first mistake they're making, right, is that they are putting logistics off. They think that it's just like a quick, simple thing that they can just like figure out towards the end. They're really focused on sourcing or they're really focused on like pricing or, or marketing or getting more customers. And, and at the end of the day, it's like logistics could be the number one thing that could just like wreck their margins yeah. and and take away the profit that they're going to move to the bottom line. And so for me, it's like you have to get the logistics right at the beginning in order for you to scale up the venture and keep your margin. And so when you say logistics, are you talking specifically about, uh, we we used to work together and I know exactly the lane lane you work in. So are you talking specifically about shipping or more than just shipping? I'm talking about first mile and last mile. I'm talking about moving, moving goods, right? So if you're not in control of the goods, moving it from your supplier to your warehouse, your warehouse to your customer or any stop in between that it might have. And, on a very basic level, I think ultimately not planning for those stops mm-hmm. along the way, it will hurt you. And okay. the fact that people put that off for so long, like they, they know they're going to do a project, right? They're saying, okay, pet food is working. You know, exercise equipment is working. Cosmetics is growing. Like they see the categories that they want to go into, but they're not thinking enough about how they're going to get those categories to the customer. That is is what makes these businesses really have a struggle at the end of the day when they're trying to scale up. What ends up being the most expensive, like sort of gotcha when, like you mentioned, scaling up. So the scaling up part is important because someone who's just getting started with an e-commerce site could probably work out of their garage or basement for a while. This is when you're growing out of that stage essentially is what you're talking about and when you do need to start getting I'm saying at, at every stage houses. of it right so okay. when you're when you're at home right when you're at home and you're in your garage you you have packing material and you're you're putting it together and you're sending it out to the customer you're slapping a label on yeah. and you're doing your own fulfillment you have right? your, your shipping bags your envelopes all that stuff yeah yeah so if you are not 100 percent crystal clear about what packaging that product is going to go into mm-hmm. and you list it online and you don't have you know, the right dimensions and you don't shop between the carriers and figure out what's the best fit for you, you could end up like giving away the the very little minuscule margin, right? So I know this guy, for example, he has thousands of used books that he inherited from a library that went out of business. Mm -hmm. And he just lists his books on eBay and he sells them and he makes maybe $3 per book, maybe less. Okay. And it's it's a thriving business, you could say. He makes maybe two to three sales a day and it's income that he doesn't have to spend a lot of time on. He doesn't advertise. He literally just like scans the skew with the camera listed on eBay and has it selling. And then he ships out whatever sells. Okay. If he does not know that some of those hardbacks are over nine inches and he has it listed at eight and a half or less where a lot of hardback books fall he's lost now two or three dollars on shipping that he thought was going to go to the bottom line. So that product is going to go out to the customer. And yet he actually lost money on that sale because he didn't have the right dimensions. And so for me, it's like every single time you're in the process of listing a product, you can spend that extra three seconds to just double check and make sure that the size are in line with what you're trying to sell um, with what you're trying to ship. If it, if the shipping is right, then you're not going to have this problem where you're like, you go to ship, it doesn't fit in the envelopes that you have, the margins are off. And that's just talking from the standpoint of small business. It gets so much worse when you become a larger company. When you're a small business and you are printing your own shipping labels um, and you print a label that is incorrect and happens to be too cheap for what you're trying to ship, what happens? The carriers can come back and basically say, like, 
the shipping is incorrect and they can, and they can like change every shipment that you've sent within the last 30 or 90 days, depending on the carrier. And that can be like hundreds of dollars out of your pocket. So as a small business where every dollar counts, that can be, you know, really bad. But okay. it gets much more exacerbated when you become a, a, a large business because you might not even have the materials to ship an item of that dimension. And so you might be putting it in too large of an envelope, too large of a box, and then paying that extra money because of those dimensions. Yeah. So it's really important to make sure just on a skew by skew basis that you have accurate shipping dimensions, weight, so that you can get the, the best possible cost. If At what point do you see your customers moving to the, like scaling up and, and what does that look like? Yeah. I mean, scaling, it can happen in so many different ways, right? So you can scale deep, right? So you can find that you, there's more customers that want the same product that you have. You can go wide, right? You can add additional products or sell to additional customers that are not buying the product that you have or are not aware of you. So you're, you're starting to advertise yourself across like, you know, new audiences or new, new places that you haven't sold before. Yeah. And so you have to find, you know, what's best for you. If you think that your audience is not completely saturated, you haven't sold to everybody that's the same, yeah. then it's better to always go deeper than wide. Wide always costs you more. But once you've exacerbated everybody, once you've exhausted everybody that you can sell to within a particular vertical, mm -hmm. I've seen this happen, right? In the last company that I worked for, we sold to literally every single person that falled in, inside that target market. And it was a niche, right? It was a, a little niche. Like there's only like 3,000 VCs in the whole world if you really think about it. Yeah. Once you've sold to every VC, you might have to go to angel investors or mm -hmm. corporate development or you know, go wider into other types of investors that, yeah. that kind of match the pattern. But we, we had a very niche product. We got product market fit. We went as deep as we could. And then it's time to go wide. What companies often do that's a mistake is that they go super wide, right? They try to sell to everyone. And really, your product is not the best fit for everyone. Mm -hmm. Your product is good for developers. Your product is good for marketers. Your product is good for salespeople. And niche, and niche, and niche, and niche down. But in reality, it's not good for everybody. It's it's good for a certain set of people. It's better, perhaps, for a certain set of people. Yeah. And so that's what you have to do in e-commerce. You have to find, okay, I want to sell to 30-something single people with a dog that want to buy organic treats, that care about what their dog eats, just like they care about what they consume because their dog is an extension of their own family. I want to sell to, you know... 20 something women, you know, with rich parents that are staying with them right now and not paying rent, yeah. you know, and I, I care about selling to people that are early tech adopters or that are, you know, stylish people or that are alcohol connoisseurs or that want to buy a car within the next 30 days to take a road trip across the country because it's not necessarily the safest thing to do to, to fly. Yeah. Um, you might find like a number of niches and you want to go as deep as you can and as specific about that type of niche, and then once you've exhausted that, then you st then you start to branch out and, and to sell to other people in other places. So if someone's watching this right now and they haven't started yet, but they have a product that they want to sell, uh, and they've decided, yes, I want to launch online, I want to start like you know create a website or whatever and start selling. Um, what do you tell that person to do first, or like the first few things that they need to do? I mean, first and foremost is to test. Right. So you want to test and make sure that you have a product that the market actually wants. Yeah. And and that's a really hard thing to do. And as much as you can test without spending a ton of money on inventory or having to take product and store it. I mean, that's that's better than, than anything. And so I'm a big believer in landing pages and Instagram ads and anything you can do to like test to yeah. see if, if the market would bear the product that you have. And yeah. then once you start to get traction and what you'll know when you get traction, when you're, when you're fulfilling more orders than you can handle, when you're, when you, people are talking about you all the time, they're tagging you, they're asking you, when are you going to get more in stock? They're asking you like, what are the products you're going to launch? Like, I love this product. Can I have something similar? That's when you really know that you've got traction. Mm -hmm. You need to then make sure that the way that you're sending that product to the end consumer is the most efficient cost effective and like good experience manner. And there's, there's a number of ways to get the product to the end consumer. So I mean, obviously the USPS is a very trusted carrier for lightweight 
So if it's under five pounds, it's very good to compare to make sure that of any carrier that's out there, UPS, FedEx, USPS, are you getting the best rate and the best speed based on the estimated delivery date for the product that you're trying to ship? Yeah. And in the process of getting it there, are you getting the scans? Are you getting the updates that will make sure that the customer is happy? Because if you're getting a lot of emails where it's like, where is my order? When is it coming? Then you know that you're not setting the, the accurate expectations about that order. Yeah. And so you ultimately need to know like, okay, am I doing what's best for the consumer right now? Because if they're asking me questions, I'm obviously not. And so the, mo the moment that you start getting a lot of questions, that's time for you to set up systems in your business so that you don't get those questions, that you can pre proactively you know, put the information in front of the consumer because they don't have to look for it. They don't have to wonder like, oh, when am I getting? Like I just ordered from this, um, this guy who I've known my whole life. He grew up in my hometown. He started his own little mask business during COVID. He shipped like a bunch of, sh of uh, shirts, you know, for COVID that had like snarky slogans about wearing a mask or whatever. Yeah. And I ordered a shirt because I, I didn't want a mask and it like the design. So I was like, I have a mask that works, whatever. So I ordered a shirt. It's now been over a month since I placed that order. So okay. it was, sep it was, um, not September. It was July 9th. And you I still don't have order. it. And I still don't have it, and I haven't gotten an update. And I'm like, where's my shirt? And it yeah. wasn't that expensive, but at the same time, it's like, it's really rude, you know? Like, I supported you, and you can't even tell me when I'm going to get the product that I just spent my hard-earned money on. Like, a lot of people are out of work right now or low on funds or underemployed. And yeah. for you to, like, not tell me, like, oh, you're working with a supplier that takes two weeks or three weeks to, like, even create the design and ship it out. Like, I haven't even gotten an order shipped notification. At this point, we're talking about, like, a situation where it's, like, not on the carriers. It's on the person that's manufacturing the design of my product. Yeah. So if there's some type of disconnect there, you have to plug that hole. You have to make sure that you set the expectation of the customer beforehand, before they spend their money, to say, this is a custom-made product. It will take three weeks or it will take four weeks or however long it's going to take. Yeah. So that they aren't like set up to be like mad at you. Yeah. And some customers are fine. You know, I didn't want to spend whatever money on this shirt. I wanted to support that guy. So for me to know that it was going to take three or four weeks, I don't care. It's not like I can't live without the shirt. You know what I mean? But at the point where it's like it's taking too long, then it just makes me feel like I just set money on fire to support that person. Whereas if the expectation was up front, how do you control so two things how do you find out what how do you find out which shipping is going to actually be the cheapest per the, th the different things that you're shipping and how do you control or find out more about the tracking and updates how do you control that situation so the customer experience is better yeah i think it's very important that whichever provider provides you shipping that you are able to understand the estimated and guaranteed delivery days. And so if the estimated delivery days are over three to seven days, that's the Amazon expectation, right? Like mm -hmm. Amazon can get something same day, right? But three to seven days is really like the bare minimum for shipping. If you know you're going to go beyond that estimated three to seven days, you have to communicate that email, text message, phone call, whatever it is to the customer to say, okay, it's not going to get within this window that you expect and see if they're fine with that before they even place the order. Yeah. And that's really dependent on the technology that they use for shipping as well as the technology that they use for the shopping cart. Mm -hmm. If they're on Shopify or Magento or Big Commerce or whatever it is, you have to be able to communicate to that customer before they place the order, this is gonna take 21 days, or this is gonna take 40 days or whatever it is, and see if they're okay with that. Let them accept that, give them the option, give them the choice. But if they place the order, and the reality is that it's going to take a lot more time to fulfill than the seven to 20, you know, seven days, I think is probably max. If it's yeah. more than seven days to fulfill, whether that be the manufacturing process, the sourcing, whatever, the design, even the shipping, because it's coming from Europe or wherever, you have to set that expectation before they give you money. Okay. And if you can't do that with your cart, then you either need to find a better supplier or a better cart or both. Okay to be able to communicate that to the end user. 
And then once you've done that, you have to understand how much is that going to cost you to land that at the customer's home and make sure that they actually got the product that they ordered. And a lot of co companies, I think, are reliant to know like, oh, I know this brand or I know this company to get this to their customer's door, but it might necess not necessarily be the best customer. So they have to look back on their order history and see how many orders were lost, you know, how many customers. Um, customers are complaining to me about not getting their order or or getting it way beyond that estimated delivery date that was promised. And yeah. then you need to make a change. And do that's the, really what it comes down to. Do the carriers have like SLAs for the shipping time? During normal times. And do they have SLAs during, for tracking too? Yeah, during normal times they definitely do. But like right now they yeah. are still overburdened, you know, I mean, UPS and USPS right now are so overburdened. FedEx seems to be handling things well, but they're not ne necessarily the cheapest option for every shipment. Do you have to like, um, go and search for each like carrier to find out every time you get a packet, or you have a shipment, you have to like go and search each different carrier to see the price that it is and then pick the lowest one or is there a better like how do you like, how do you do that the best way? Yeah, that, that could be definitely very tedious if you have a package that's in the middle. And I think five five to ten pounds is definitely a, a question area where you're like, hmm, what's the best carrier to do this with? What's amazing is that a lot of the carriers allow you to set up an account online without talking to anyone, without doing a bunch of grunt work to set them up. And so if you're okay with having pickups from multiple companies – multiple trucks that you have to prepare by a certain time, mm -hmm. you you can rate shop and you can see mm -hmm. who's going to be the best carrier for the transit time that you want and the cost. And I feel very, very fortunate to work with EasyPost because they allow you to rate shop between all those different carriers and see, yep. you know, who's going to be the best option based on those variables. Okay. Gotcha. And then for the tracking side, you're, are you just sort of like bold into like whoever does the best tracking? I think that that tracking is it's it's a sticky issue, right? Because a lot of packages are going through sort facilities depending on where you're located in the country. Like USPS can get your package to every major metro in like two to three days, right? Yeah. But you might not know that it's coming in two days because they might not scan that package as frequently because they're just trying to get it get there as fast as possible. Yeah. Whereas you know a FedEx UPS package it might be scanned more often, but not might not get there in two to three days, for example. And so I think as far as tracking goes, one benefit of working with our company is that you can see all the tracking statuses that the carrier gives, no matter what carrier it is. Mm -hmm. And so you can essentially see like how your package is moving through the mail stream through across the country, across the world, um, through those different scans, regardless of who it's going with. Gotcha. Um, what sort of things do your customers struggle the most with like inside this area? Like, give me some stories, give me some like questions that you've got from customers. Where you're like, or you just get them over and over and over. I mostly work with software platforms and software platforms are enabling merchants to list their goods online, sell and ship them. And software platforms very frequently underestimate how much work it takes to set up this kind of like cross border, shipping and logistics like ecosystem right so they're not talking to the carriers they're not thinking about shipping as much as they are thinking about like what's the the design of the site the colors the experience of the brand mm -hmm. and that's a mistake because if you can't even get a parcel from the warehouse to the customer's door you're ultimately not in business and you have to really think about what that experience is going to be like and think about it in context of how you're going to design the front end of the site, how you're going to make sure that you can retrieve all the necessary information from the customer and from the carrier in order to make sure that you can get the parcel there in the most efficient way. And it's amazing how many customers get through this process of building these really beautiful websites after months and months and months and can't actually perform the actions that the, ver the merchants need to get their goods to the customer store. And so my advice is always to think about the whole life cycle of the customer, not just how the design and the colors and the brand are pretty, but also the function yeah. of 
moving that good through every stage from manufacturing to warehousing to fulfillment. And that and that's really clear and 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 and, and it's hard because if anybody hasn't worked in logistics and they're just in e-commerce and they they know that their their product is going to be popular, it's going to be important, they might think like, "Oh, logistics is easy." Or like, "Oh, like how hard is it to just drop off a package at the USPS or whatever it is?" And that's what they, what happens so often is that they put this off as the last thing and they should have been thinking about it from the beginning. Uh, do you have any recommendations for like logistics tools that sort of make things easier for people? And like, why do you recommend one tool over another? Yeah, I really love Order Hive. I also love Order Desk. Mm -hmm. I think what's interesting about logistics tools, they all have the same name. It's ship or order or you know, they, they're easy to get confused, but Order, order Hive and Order Desk, what they've done is they've made it very easy to connect to marketplaces, eBay, Shopify, um, mm -hmm. you know, all the different marketplaces that you might be setting, selling your goods to end consumers, as well as where your different warehouse locations are in the world and where you might actually have stock. And so you might have, I have 50 lollipops in Florida. I have 100 orders from Florida coming from eBay. So I will be able to fulfill 50 orders from Florida and 50 orders from my other locations in mm -hmm. Austin and California. And the, the shipping from Austin and California are going to be higher from those locations than they are in Florida. And so I'm able to do that calculation and that, that understanding of the complexity mm -hmm. of having multiple locations. And so I love those tools, for example, as a good starter place. And then as the customer goes up market, there's so many good tools um, I think one of the best ones for enterprise, for example, is Inveo. They have an amazing warehouse management system where if you have multiple locations, multiple SKUs, you know, multiple workflows that you want to try to automate, Inveo like really works with you on a personalized level to figure that out yeah. and customize your your workflow, you know, you for your scaling business. I know you you work with a lot of these clients as part of your day job. Do you do any consulting yeah. with any of them too? And if so, can people get in yeah. touch with you to get help from you? Yeah, that's a huge part of my role. And it goes beyond logistics because the benefit of my role is that I get to see every stage of the process of launching an e-commerce business mm -hmm. from figuring out where demand is figuring out how to source product that's going to fulfill that demand, mm -hmm. setting up warehouse operations with a third party or for yourself, um, and, and beginning to ship those products out and really shipping it with the best carriers that are going to suit the needs of those variables that are within your product. So smaller products should really go FedEx to USPS, and larger products should really go FedEx or U UPS, yep. and really figuring out who's the best carrier for that. And if you think need things to move really fast, maybe – thinking about some of the regional up and coming players that are out there in the market and partnering with those companies to figure out who is the best person to solve those particular issues. Chances are I've already spoken with somebody that can solve that problem. Gotcha. Um, and so that's the thing that I, that I really love about my role is that at the end of the day, companies come to us for a logistics problem, but I might be able to so solve, any kind of supply chain problem. Where can people reach you if they're interested in your consulting? Um, I think, you know, sword.johnson at easy post is a, a great email for me. Yep. LinkedIn, I'm active on Twitter. Um, so I do respond to social media messages as well. Um, I do have an Instagram account, um, not as active on there, but you could certainly message me. What's it's, that? Um, it's a good way, you know, to reach out and, what, and see your... if there's something that I can help you with. What's your email again? Sora.Johnson, S-A-U-R-A, J-O-H-N-S-T-O-N, um, at easy post, like easy postage, but easy post .com, Cool. Um, is a great, is the great way to reach me. And please add it to, to the notes. Sora, you continue to amaze me. I'm so excited for your future as well as um, excited for the people who get to watch this. This is a really just awesome. All right. I hope you all enjoyed this video. I had a blast making it. Thank you again, Sora. And until next time, subscribe to the channel, hit the like, and click on the affiliate links down below to support. All right. See ya.